This project uh, was part of the, the story of the urban room, which was to inspire children into the built environment and into everything that's going on in our city, which is quite a lot at the moment. So we started by taking the children to the city council and looking at all the different uh, roles and all the different disciplines that are involved in uh, designing and producing the city and getting it to work, which is a very complex system. We looked at all the different roles that people were um, carrying out and the, the hierarchies and the children started to understand that complex system how it works. We did that and then we translated that same system of operation into the project. The project, they will tell you all about it, I'm not going to, but I can tell you that they, we chose to um, do an analogy with a beehive for the project. So not only they could choose what area of interest, what discipline they wanted to work on, whether it might be architecture or literacy or music or anything else, but they also could choose what role they wanted to play in that team. So some of the children chose to be a queen bee and be team leaders. Some of them decided to be honeybees and produce most of the work. And other children were bumblebees. So they were the ones that kept communication going, everything coordinated, and all the teams working together. Um, you can see what the children chose to be and what they did in the poster, so I'm not going to go into detail. There's a lot of information here. Um, the children came to this room to become more engaged in the built environment and to learn how, as they grow and as citizens, they can become more part of shaping the city through the planning system. So how can they have an active role in doing all of this? Because the built environment um, has a lot to, to say about how healthy we are. So we have an agenda on how to keep our heritage um, and protect it. Um, our health and well-being, how to be resilient through climate change, and safety and justice. So the children have been learning all about that. It's quite a lot of work. Nothing like this was attempted before. This is a very complex project. You will see when you see what the children have done. And after having done it, the teachers are now know why it has never been attempted before. <laughs> it was quite hard. But it was super enjoyable. I want to thank the teachers for all their hard work. Being a parent of the school and being married to a teacher of the school, I know the work that goes on projects like this. But I think for this one particularly, to be here today and to have everything up and running, these teachers, particularly Ms. Howe and uh, Mr. Thompson, have put so much effort. So thank you for that. Thank you to the students for putting so much passion doing this actually got inspired because I, I honestly didn't think that they could produce what they did and that they could understand the built environment that was inspirational. They're super creative. Thanks to the parents for lending us such talented children. It really opened my eyes to what we can do and what they can do. Um, and I'm not going to say any more because they have a lot to say themselves so I hope you enjoy the evening. Just in case you missed it before, here's a video of what we've been doing. Hello and welcome to the Urban Room. On behalf of our students, we invite you to sit down and enjoy this presentation. This video was created to show all of you the progress we've made this past year. A selected group of students have been coming down to the Urban Room every month since the beginning of this project. We have been working with the City Council to regenerate Carrington Street near the city centre. The task that we were assigned was to capture the general atmosphere of the street by telling stories, composing music, performing the dramatic arts, creating artistic interpretations. interpretations, and designing buildings. We did this by working as a team and fully committing to the project at hand. We were split into different teams depending on what we were good at. Within each group, we had different roles. Together, the roles are known as the hive mentality. This is because each role has a type of bee attached to it, which is true to actual hives. So the roles were bumblebees, who are for communication, the queen bee, the head of the group, and the honey bee, who dedicate their whole time towards one group. I'm Alex. And I'm Millie. And, and we're, we're from, from the music group. 
Throughout this project, we have been making a piece of music based on the architecture of Carrington Street. We have also been using the streetscape and looking at the way that the buildings are formed to choose which instruments we use and to create their musical line. Hi, welcome to our team. What we did in our team was designed and drew and painted facades from the first building of Carrington Street to the last and our current 3D model design on Carrington Street. What really inspired us was the, di the diversity in architecture over the years on Carrington Street, which we used different mediums to portray. We really try to accurately represent each time period from the start of Carrington Street to the end, just because we found that really, really important and really key in demonstrating what Harriet just said, the change in architecture. This has been Art Team. Hi, I'm Hannah from the History Group. We tried to create videos from the past events for, of Carrington Street in Nottingham. We went out to Carrington Street to, to see what things we could do and we used the train station, the canal and other things as well. We tried to recreate events from the past such as the King coming from Carrington Street into Nottingham. Hello, I am the spokesperson of the 3D Design Group. Over the course of our time here, we've made a building, a 3D building using SketchUp. Um, the, it has three floors. The first floor is, is futuristic. The, the middle floor is based on the present day and the top floor is based on the um, past. Um, I was inspired by a 3D printer and how it made, how it made literally everything, anything you wanted. From literacy. Um, in literacy, we made a series of short stories, stories to capture the dynamics and general environment of Carrington Street through a series of progressions in time. Yes. Um, what inspired us? We were working with the art and music, so we were kind of trying to put everything together. So they were doing past, present and future. So we had that idea and theme of maybe breaking our roles up so we could write out different stories linking to each other. And it would like go with history and art and music at the same time. And now for the part that the students are gonna hate most. Before the project started, we visited Locksley House, the home of Nottingham City Council. We made Lego models as a prototype for our new building on Carrington Street. We also learned about the importance of mathematical proportions in architectural design and the principles of urban planning applied by the City Council in a seminar delivered by Dr. Alvarez. Now, once the project started, we took photos of the facade, the urban room and other buildings on Carrington Street. I made it into a speed skate. 
From this, we created rough sketches and designs using proportion and math skills to build up a rough picture. We then used SketchUp to make a 3D model of the building before putting together a final design. We also recently visited Nottingham Trent University to watch experts use 3D modeling software and show us their own projects they were working on. They printed our final design and matched it to a wooden model of the buildings. Next, we are going to show our literacy pieces. The theme of the writing was past, present, and future, and each literacy piece represents part of the story linked with Carrington Street. Hope you enjoy. When you face the sapling into the small hole in the ground and covered the gaps with loose bits of soil, she gently smoothed over the turf with her palms. With some effort, Winnie stood up and eyed her handiwork with a wry smile. The sapling was given to her by Mr. Ishmael, who owned the bakery next door. Mr. Ishmael is the kind man who used to give her plants to grow in his garden. When he could remember the sad look which lined his tired features as he gave her the small sapling, it was almost a look of pity. When he turned to her family's graves, which lay in a small grove, by each grave was a red flower donated by the florist down the street when her mother passed away. The baker, the florist, and the people of Carrington. They, were all, they all held a special place somewhere in a strewn heart. However, even the nicest, nicest of them couldn't have lend, lend a hand when a family suffered. In some twisted way, she hated them. Hated the selfishness. Hated how all they could do was give small blessings and watch. Winnie felt guilty every time the thought crossed her mind. Winnie doubted they could do anything, even if they tried. People say that her parents were too ambitious. They say that maintaining their business and fighting off the grown competition, as well as raising their child and infant, was reckless. Instead of moving away from the bustling streets of Carrington where they had a chance, her parents were adamant. Some thought her parents' time and business would finally push the torrents over the edge. But the result was rather contradictory. They had only boosted their desire to keep fighting. Only after her little brother fell sick did her parents start regret. Regret, regretting their choices. All anyone could say then was, I told you. Winnie can still see her once dignified parents drop on their knees, groveling and sobbing, to earn something, anything for their baby's treatment. In the end, it was futile. The medicine they went, earned went to waste, and their baby passed away. Her family's funds could hardly cover the cost of a proper gravestone, so they were forced to mark the grave with planks of wood. A week flew by and when he was gifted with another death, it was her father. He had been pushing his portions of food aside so that his wife and daughter could eat more, refusing to eat until they had enough. Of course, there were never days that they felt full, and soon enough he starved away. After his death, her mother's mentality shattered. She was convinced they couldn't live without her husband, and his death finally tipped her over. Not even a day later, she took her own life, leaving Winnie, her daughter, behind. The whole event seemed so surreal. Even now, Winnie can help but believe this was all a dream, a nightmare when she was stuck in that sense of overbearing helplessness. She could do nothing but watch her life deteriorate. However, she knew deep inside that she was awake. Winnie left a small backyard and stumbled into her house. She pushed her body against the rotting back door which slung loosely on its hinges. Her legs ached with exhaustion and she knew that soon enough she'd collapse on her own body weight and never get up again. But there was one last thing she wanted to do before she joined everyone. One last thing she wanted to see. Winnie tracked herself upstairs. Every step made her feel as though she was running towards the end of a long race. Why am I so cold? By the end, Winnie finally, by the time Winnie finally reached the landing, she was ready to fall into a fitful sleep. Winnie dropped into her meek knees and called the rest of the way to the attic window. Finally, Winnie sat down. There was no relief to her pain as her death neared, only the comfort to know there would be an end to this hell. She scribbled a few messy words into a wooden pulp and laid it on her laps. Winnie could feel her eyelids beginning to sink, and before she let them fall, she gave one last glance towards her family's grave and the small sapling that would one day grow up to be a beautiful tree. For the first time in what seems like years, the little girl cried. 
Tears of happiness leaping with her bright snipe smile as she finally disappeared. Present. Hunter ran up to his room. He'd been fighting with his brother again. He hated Carter. He was always blaming Hunter for things he'd done. And just because Carter was younger, he got away with everything. He was only young about five minutes. Yes, Carter and Hunter were twins. Everyone always has these stereotypical twins in their heads, telepathy and all that, but these twins were different. He must have fallen asleep because his phone alarm was going off. Oh, and he had a message from an unknown number. Weird, right? Well, the message said, go to the attic, Hunter. Hunter didn't even know they had an attic. They always just threw away all the stuff they weren't using. Besides, they could always buy more as they were the wealthiest family on Carrington Street by a long stretch. However, curiosity got the better of him, and he climbed the stairs to the dusty attic, warily not knowing what was up there. He wandered around and almost jumped out of his skin as a plump, hairy rat scurried through his legs. He found himself in the darkest part of the attic, around a slight corner from the rest of the room. There, in a heap of dust and faded cloth, were the bones of a small child. Hunter leapt back in fright and started towards the top of the stairs when he stopped. Had he seen a note near the remains? Hunter's nosiness overthrew any fear that he had had as he crept back to the corner. It had been an over It's the year 2525 and the whole world has been isolated in virtual reality. The caring, passionate, loving generations like Winnie's are long gone. They've been replaced by modern technophones, where history has almost been completely forgotten. Time is almost up. Planet Earth is on its last legs. The world <coughs> is ending. Everyone knows it. The robotic government. They use as politicians who make no impact on anything, even children. Children were brought up knowing that every second gone is a second closer to their last. The Earth can't cope with the new inventions and cyberspace ways of living, <coughs> for example, teleportation pods. The positive generations have been buried along with winners. All the people think virtual reality life is more important than real life. Because the world's ending, their lives will be over before they know it. People don't even bother to plug themselves in anymore. They'd sooner just run out of charge than carry on in the world. There's no remains of the small sapling we need planted all those years ago. People should have stopped, taken the world back to how it was before all this, how it was in her day. Now it's too late. When first looking at the building, we will notice it to the signs. This is what we try to focus heavily on in our art pieces, to make each one represent a specific time period on Carrington Street. We did miniatures of each building <coughs> on small canvases in our art area. Another key part was linking our art to other groups' ideas. Music and literacy were the groups we worked particularly closely with. We followed the theme of past, present and future and applied that to our art, especially in our use of the black and white. Literacy, however, worked with us very closely on our past pieces, even having a painting of Winnie plant planting her tree mood. Max will now talk about how we made a tree and the 3D roots model. Play and wire, I created a tree to go along with the literature piece, depicting the tree planted by women. In addition, I used cardboard and laser cut pieces of wood from the university to create the 3D model. The 3D model was then painted by the rest of the art team. We had a high of working on the historical attributes and identities of the buildings we were inter interpreting. The history team helped us greatly with the appearances and additional information about the building, really helping the whole of our world apart. We are now going to pass on to the history team so they can tell you in more detail about what they've done. We are the history team. We enjoyed creating videos based on the past of Carrington Street. Fun fact, did you know the King used this street as a main route into Nottingham? We will now show you the videos we created. We hope you enjoy them. Hi, I'm a time traveller. Come with me to see the history of Carrington Street. Did you hear that explosion last night? Yeah, I woke the kids up, struggled getting them back to sleep. Sounds like the Blitz. What are the Blitz? Oh, nothing. What's the date? The 29th of September, 1818. Why? Rude. Probably one of them lot wanting a job at the mines. Yeah, I'm really glad my Michael hasn't lost his job. We want to lose our jobs. Why, darling? Because we had to carry 200 kilos and it took us 20 journeys. And if we showed signs of slacking, then they whip us. And other days we'd work into water up to our thighs. 
I can't believe it. I know. It's a tremendous honour to go on a train for a whole day to go to another city. Oh, where are you going? Leicester. I did hear someone else was doing something like this. Oh, who? I believe his name was Sir Thomas Cook. Oh, never heard of him. We have created. We have been exploring the connections between music and architecture. Before you hear our piece, we would like you to listen and listen if you can hear any connections between our work and the work of all the other groups. know what to do for our piece until we made our streetscape of Carrington Street. This is when we noticed a similarity in music and architecture, the highs and lows, the repetition and differences. So we made a piece based on the streetscape that we that you have just seen. Notice how the different parts of the windows and arches represent the music lines and instruments. Now to Charlotte and Gabby. Thank you. 